Today on Stronger Than Reason, we talk about Nine Inch Nails' groundbreaking 1994 album, The Downward Spiral. Welcome to Stronger Than Reason. 1994 was an interesting year, as I recall it. I was wrapping up college, starting my career, hanging out with friends, and in short, starting to emerge from what I thought of as the machine, you know, the washing machine of life that one goes through when you're going off to live on your own for the first time. And I was getting glimpses into what life might be like after school, although for me there would still be a few unpredictable curveballs, but maybe I'll get into those some other time. I do remember hanging out with friends that spring term and being really into Pink Floyd's The Division Bell, They were at the height of their powers under David Gilmour and would soon embark on a record-breaking world tour. However, I would never see them live, unfortunately. Uh, What else? I remember sitting in my friend Bill's apartment watching Dave Letterman attempt to interview Madonna, and it's common now to wonder, what was it I just watched? But (laughs) that was the first time I had had that feeling, and we just laughed about it for days at least until Kurt Cobain committed suicide. And I remember walking into my class building the next day, going down the front hall, uh, and one of the offices had a big poster of Kurt's face on the door. And it was a black and white shot of him wearing eyeliner and just staring directly into the camera. Now, I wasn't a tremendous Nirvana fan, but being a card-carrying member of Generation X, I had a certain affinity for them. And... All I could think was, you know, that poor guy, what a waste. Sometimes you wish life had an undo button, you know, and I'd have much the same feeling a couple years later when Bradley Noel would die, leaving his band sublime with fame and a hit single and no functioning band to enjoy the success. And side note there, that story might have a happy ending after all, but More on that in a future episode. Uh, Maybe you know about it. Maybe you're paying attention. Of course, I was still playing a lot of Doom in 94. It was the killer app of the time. As I mentioned in episode 42, I'd carry around a couple floppy disks with Doom on it, and I would install it on the school computer labs like I'm sure hundreds of other students were doing, and the lab workers would just as diligently erase it from the machines every night, and we were playing a little cat and mouse game. The cool thing about Doom, of course, which I've already discussed, is how organic it felt. Doom was to VR of the time as Star Wars was to sci-fi that came before it, and both invented a world that was lived in and filthy, and they weren't clinically clean like their contemporaries. And prior to Doom, most video games had palettes of bright primary colors. Even its predecessor, Wolfenstein 3D, had a lot of bright blue and red and yellow. Doom, on the other hand, presented a world of darkness in shades of green, brown, and gray. The only bright colors were enemy eyeballs and muzzle flashes, and that was it. And I'd argue that Doom was so successful that it left an imprint on the pop culture of the time. And maybe that tied into grunge in general, you know, the way Grunge valued lo-fi, gritty roots rock over polished studio masterpieces. And remember, Doom came out in in December of 93. And at the time, I thought it was a perfect encapsulation of this new, darker aesthetic. But of course, just a few months later, we got the newest offering from one of my favorite bands, Nine Inch Nails. And it was an unusual single that stylistically seemed to fit Doom like a glove carrying over the harder edge aspects of grunge into the world of industrial rock. It came out in February of 94. I mean, I'd been expecting new material from them for a couple of years at that point, given that their most recent stuff, the broken and fixed EPs, had come out in 92. So 93 for me was essentially free of Nine Inch Nails. And word on the street was that they were working on their follow-up to 1989's Pretty Hate Machine. Now, I covered all of their earlier stuff in previous episodes, so Pretty Hate Machine was way back in episode 8, more than a year ago, and Broken and Fixed were episode 31. So go back and check those out 
for all of the excruciating detail, but the TLDR was that these releases were stepping stones. Pretty Hate Machine was fairly catchy stuff, though harder edge than its contemporaries. It was a successful blend of industrial noise and 80s synth pop. Broken, on the other hand, sent the band in a much harder metalish direction, sounding more like ministry than ever, but with more of a dynamic and expressive range, mixing harder songs with softer songs, and it would be an indication of things to come. Fixed, on the other hand, was kind of an oddball. It just threw all convention out the window and demonstrated a willingness on the band's part to hand their material over to some of the most experimental industrial musicians of the day, such as Coyle and J.G. Thurwell, resulting in a record that could be described as old-school industrial in a kind of throbbing gristle sense of the word, and all of this clearly showed that Nine Inch Nails was on a journey away from their rock-pop roots. But to where, we wondered, what was next? Well, we had all of 1993 to ponder that. I guess I had expected another monster industrial rock hit to follow up on, say, Wish or Happiness and Slavery from Broken, something in that vein, something maybe with a dash of commercial potential that the label would market with a million dance remixes. But whatever was on this forthcoming album, you'd expect the lead-off single to be the most crowd-pleasing selection, right? But no! When the band had left TVT for Interscope, part of the deal was that they got total creative control. They would make music, and the label would release it. Period. Therefore, in February of 94, we received March of the Pigs. And it was confusing at first. It was a very short mashup of three song parts. A frenetic punk rock slam dance and some strange time signature. A 4-4 techno breakdown with samples. And finally, a weird solo piano riff followed by a complete pause. It was those three segments, repeat them twice, and that's the song. Uh, clearly violating all the golden rules of pop. And indeed, it only only hit 59 in the Billboard singles chart. However, it boded well for the possibility of slam dancing at the eventual concerts. And indeed, the video demonstrated that. Uh, we all eagerly watched it on MTV back in the day. Interested to see and hear this next iteration of the band. The first thing we noticed was that the video was really stripped back. It was just the band film performing the song in front of a white screen. I also noticed that it was directed by Peter Christofferson of Coil, but really it's about as minimalistic a video as could be, with essentially no filter between you, the viewer, and a very young, hyped up, and exhausted band playing this song for the two dozenth time or whatever it was. The energy coming off the screen was palpable, and you know, back then we were still five years away from the Blair Witch Project. so. That handheld camera work with the zooming in and out and the wobbling back and forth and the lo-fi film stock made the whole thing just seem really sinister, like a video we maybe weren't supposed to see. It was the exact opposite of every other blow-dried and squared-off video on MTV, and it proved that Nine Inch Nails didn't need any fancy production. It was enough for them to just get behind their instruments and blast the song out. But, you know, let's be real here. The song was a real curveball. No one could have predicted it if some AI had tried to predict the next Nine Inch Nails single from all their previous work. March of the Pigs would not have emerged. But it was intriguing for that very reason. There was an element of unpredictability. They weren't just regressing to the mean. They were taking things in another direction. So at this point, spring of 1994, I was living in a single room at school, and you know, I was pretty disconnected from everyone. I was never really a lonely guy, but I think that period of time was maybe about as lonely as I ever was. I was kind of out of touch with most of my close friends, except through email, spending days just going to class, not really hanging out much. Social interactions were mostly limited to going down to Bill's to watch TV and gathering with the floor whenever some idiot pulled the fire alarm, which seemed to happen weekly. So maybe this music at the time resonated a bit. 
you know, I was feeling a bit isolated, kind of out on a limb. And, you know, as it turned out, things would change for me in a hurry. There's always ups and downs. And I would join a new friend group, as the kids say today. And that new bunch of people would at least get me through the rest of my school career, if not last much longer in my life. And it is kind of funny thinking back how people just came and went back then. Someone would be like a brother and then bam, I would <laughs> I'd never see him again. And that's just part of being in the washing machine of being a young adult and uh, moving through that transition in life. But the more I played this song, March of the Pigs, the more I liked it. And the artwork was really something else too. It was a piece by Russell Mills, who was a UK artist. I thought it was just super organic looking. I didn't know what it was exactly. It seemed to be some kind of mixed media painting, but it looked to me like a piece of wood that had been painted or burned and repainted and reburned, like kind of like the end result of a long process. And I think that's what he was going for here. He wanted, wanted something worn in, something like you see in the Star Wars universe, something organic and dirty and decayed. And as an art kid, I really dug it. Uh, I liked that it wasn't just very flat graphic design. There was a lot more going on there. And the art was also set off by very clean typography. And it would turn out that he would use that typography in every release in this era. And in fact, would later revisit it on hesitation marks, but more on that later. Music-wise, this single had various mixes of the track, plus one original B-side, an instrumental called A Violet Fluid, which is just this sort of staggered loop of some beats that last about a minute. All in all, I took this offering from Nine Inch Nails as an interesting turn of events, and it made me look forward to the album, which, needless to say, I planned to pick up on release day, and I didn't have to wait long because it dropped about two weeks later. And here it is. The Downward Spiral, otherwise known as Halo 8. And much like March of the Pigs, it was designed to confound, but also to exceed expectations. And I don't remember the exact circumstances of picking this up, but I must have bought it at the Sam Goody store at school, or whatever store that was. And uh, what were my initial thoughts? Well, the artwork again was by Russell Mills. And what is it exactly? Uh, it looks to me like another mixed media piece, this time maybe painted on cheesecloth. Uh, if you look really close, you can see the texture here, and then it's burnt or otherwise stained. And here it looks like there's some paint peeling off with wire over it, and then there's moths here and there. But wait, you know, there's more. This isn't just a jewel case, it's actually a slip case. And the whole thing is packaged like a little box set, you know, with some actual care. So, so you've got the actual jewel case here with an alternate cover. There's more organic colors and, you know, something that looks like metal here. And this opens up, you know, more artwork in the inside. And the disc itself has a print of the curled up millipede that would appear on subsequent releases. More on that later. And then you get this awesome booklet. I mean, this booklet is 27 pages, 27 pages. And that's a far cry from say KMFDM who released angst around this time with a single two-sided piece of paper as the cover insert. So this packaging is positively indulgent. And again, you got the NIN logo here, which of course you have to have in here somewhere at this time reinterpreted by Russell Mills in the same fashion. And you have more of his art on the inside, of course. Um, you have some lyrics. You have some credits. Who did what? And uh, speaking of credits, I noticed some familiar names in here. Uh, Alan Mulder, for one, who I mostly remembered from his work with Curve. And Flood, of course, plus some additional musicians that we'll talk about momentarily. So all in all, you know, I was super pleased to get this deluxo packaging. It's not what I expected. I mean, the artwork alone was worth the $15 or whatever I paid for this CD back in 1994. And did all of my other friends rush out to get this? Uh, I could tell you one that did, at least. Uh, my friend Salty, he was the guy I stayed up with to download Doom on its release night just a few months prior. 
Now, we were living in different cities by this point, but we were staying in regular touch by the wonders of email, and both of us were really into where Nine Inch Nails were going. And as it turned out, the downward spiral would be the soundtrack to the rest of our year. And that's it, I think. I don't remember it making a huge splash with my other friends, but maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe they'll correct me. I just don't recall. Uh, Surely everyone was aware of this album from MTV. If not for the album's release, they would certainly, certainly be aware of it by the time the second single dropped again, which we'll talk about shortly. How could we not? But I think for a time, it was just Salty and me getting into this. And of course, I was by then spending a lot of time on Rec Music Industrial, where initial reviews were cautiously favorable. Surprise, surprise. As I said in episode 8, so many of the devout on there considered Pretty Hate Machine to be so much whiny pap, and certainly very light and presetty compared to the gritty experimentalism of true industrial bands like Coil and Throbbing Gristle and uh, yeah, whoever, SPK and Einsterzen Neubauten and Test Department, I suppose. I mean, how dare anyone make industrial music that was listenable, right? I mean, these folks could buy that Fixed was the sound that they liked, you know, that old school annoying sample delica that grated the ears, but they attributed that record to the remixers, not so much to the band. But here, they had to recognize March of the Pigs as something like the jagged metal crusty O, surrounded by sweetness, but still guaranteed to tear up your digestive tract. So I think they were kind of into it. There was some enthusiasm for the album. And when it dropped, it hit RMI like a bomb. As I recall, it dominated conversation for months. Why? Because there was just a lot to chew on here. Uh, It was unexpected in the same way that March of the Pigs was unexpected. Because what we had here was a true album, not just a collection of songs. It was constructed as an end-to-end listening experience, taking you, the listener, on a journey, as it turns out, to some pretty dark places. And in this era of doom and Gen X, arguably post-grunge, that approach hit all the right notes. So I've gone this far into this episode without mentioning the Nine Inch Nails mastermind by name, believe it or not. But now I do want to take a moment to talk about who the band were in early 94. Remember, the previous EPs, Broken and Fixed, weren't toured. So the March of the Pigs video showed the first live incarnation of the band since the Pretty Hate Machine era, and it had changed considerably. Nine Inch Nails proper was still just Trent Reznor, of course. He wrote all the music, sang all the songs, and had the final say on every aspect of the band. Everyone else was just serving at his pleasure as extra studio musicians and the live band. The most senior of these was Chris Vrenna, who was acting as Trent's right-hand man as well as live drummer. Chris, during this time, was helping build Trent's sample library and was spending a lot of time on sound design, trying to match the music that Trent heard in his head. Then we had two guitarists, of course. Robin Fink made his debut with the band at this time, and of all these other guys, is the only one who's still in the live band as of 2024. Robin is a soft-spoken guy who nevertheless plays some mean guitar. And the other bassist, guitarist, keyboardist was Danny Lohner, who is a bit of a character. And last but not least, James Woolley on keys. And from everything I've seen and heard about James, he was an extraordinarily nice guy. And sadly, he's the only one of these guys who is no longer with us, having passed away in 2016 at the very young age of 46. R.I.P. You know, if you're going to play keyboards, you arguably can't get any cooler than playing keyboards in Nine Inch Nails. So much respect. And that's the band as it appeared in that video and which would hit the road on the self-destruct tour later that year, which I'll talk about more in a bit. But the live band was a little different from who played on the record, although Chris and Danny contributed to a few songs. We'll talk about the guests as we go through the tracks. My own response to this album, I gotta say, was mixed. I recognized that it was a milestone in industrial rock, but I wasn't sure if I liked it or not. To me, things were becoming maybe maybe a bit too prog rock and the downward spiral struck me as 
a <gasps> concept album. And don't get me wrong, I do like some prog. I'm obviously a fan of Rush and Pink Floyd, but I'm wary of prog that's indulgent for the sake of indulgence. When it's more interested in being clever than in being fun to listen to. So think about Pink Floyd's The Wall. Great concept, and without a doubt, stellar in places. But let's face it, at least half that album is Roger Waters' program music that, to me anyway, holds little or no musical interest. I just don't keep coming back to listen to songs like Empty Spaces or Vera over and over again, you know? I'm sure they're great in context, but... I'm always looking for a good tune, not high concepts. And it always comes down to the song for me. And I'm asking myself, is this something I want to listen to more than once? And too often in that 70s prog thang, the answer is no. But clearly Trent was pushing things in strange new directions. I had to give him credit for just not making Pretty Hate Machine 2, or even Broken 2 for that matter, because this was clearly a different beast. To my ears, the biggest difference was one of sound design. There were few, if any, preset sounds on this record. It was a rock record for the most part, but composed almost entirely of treated sounds, some of which were so heavily treated they were not recognizable at all. So sampling was as important as the effects, or maybe more important, which separated this album from, say, Ministry, who were more interested in just dropping samples onto traditional a very heavy instrumentation. And since we're talking about peers here, I don't think the downward spiral even approaches Skinny Puppy for sheer sampling prowess. I think anyone who knows these albums would agree that Too Dark Park and Last Rites are more sonically adventurous and unpredictable. The difference here is that Nine Inch Nails are still working within a recognizable pop format, and Skinny Puppy, for the most part, or not. Skinny Puppy were never likely to get played on the radio, but Nine Inch Nails did in a big way, even with their weird sounds and transgressive lyrics, as we'll see. The other big difference on this album was in its tonal range. So Pretty Hate Machine, I thought, was fairly even throughout. The only real tonal change was in the one ballad, Something I Can Never Have, which slowed things down a bit. Things got a little more interesting on Broken, where Trent threw a couple really quiet songs in with the extremely loud songs. So Pinion and Help Me I Am In Hell break up what would otherwise be a thick blast of guitar, drums, and screaming. So on the downward spiral, things are just like all over the map. Tracks range from quiet and contemplative to dense, complex, and ear-splitting. In general, he's touching on far more styles here, making for a more varied listen. It's not all industrial rock by the numbers. Now, this is a far cry from, say, a Frontline Assembly album or a KMFDM album, where the songs are practically fungible. As I mentioned, this is a proper album designed to be listened to as such from end to end. Now, I don't know if Trent has ever gone on record fully explaining the concept and how every track fits into it. And even if he had done that, I don't necessarily want to know about it. I mean, a big aspect of appreciating music and art in general is in finding your own meaning in it. And it lessens the power of the work when you're told what it all means by the creator. So what does the downward spiral mean to me? Uh, I suppose it's not all that different from The Wall, really. I think it's the story of one person's descent into depression and self-harm. And if I had to guess, it's probably based on a true story of how Trent felt throughout the mid-90s. He was riding a wave of success that, while it hadn't yet made him a household name, it did rank him at the forefront of industrial rock, much like Kurt Cobain was thrust into the forefront of grunge. And, you know, I imagine that there was other stuff going on here, not just the usual rock and roll excess. I think there were probably one or more medical conditions at play that made things a lot tougher for him. And all of those things conspired to put him in a very bad headspace. And that energy found its release on this album. <clears throat> but was I a fan? You know, was I on board? I have to say that at the time I wasn't 100% into the downward spiral. I recognize it as an important and influential album which spawned 
any number of imitators and brought Nine Inch Nails near universal acclaim, but it's not a record that I listen to a lot these days. Probably because of the proggy and high concept hijinks that tend to make this album disappear up its own ass from time to time. But let's face it, some of the lyrics are over the top for the sake of being over the top. Kind of like if he had asked the staff of The Onion to write some Nine Inch Nails lyrics, you know, they might have come up with some of these things. You know, ooh, we're being transgressive by putting the F-bomb in a chorus or talking frankly about sex. Uh, Trust me, it was a lot more shocking in 94 to hear this stuff than it is today, for sure. So it might be hard to relate to that. But no, I wasn't 100% into it. I have to say that maybe I was, I don't know, like 75% into it. I do think that there is some weaker stuff in this album, or at least stuff that to me seems redundant. I think that 14 tracks were a lot. This is over an hour of music, and I get that it's art, and it has layers of meaning, and that all these things interconnect and contribute to a more powerful, unified whole. I just think that for 20-something me, it was a lot to swallow, and I would end up replaying certain songs over and over, but wouldn't listen to the whole album end to end, which really, come to think of it, is the same way that I consume The Wall. And maybe someday I'll talk about The Wall once I get through a few other more important Floyd albums, that is. Anyway, that's enough fooling around. Let's get to the track by track. And things start off, and you'll never be able to read this on here, but this is the track listing. Things start off with Mr. Self-Destruct, which interestingly features Mr. Adrian Ballou on guitar, speaking of prog rock. And for those not familiar, Adrian is a mainstay of Robert Fripp's masterful prog rock band King Crimson and is not only an outstanding traditional guitarist, but is also noted for pushing the boundaries of what a guitar and guitarist can do. And he's worked really hard to develop a wide repertoire of very strange and unusual techniques to get all sorts of sounds out of a guitar. And I suppose... He put those skills to good use here, where you can hear him on the song's outro. And it's funny, because I do remember reading in some music magazine at the time, it was probably Alternative Press, where Adrian got in the studio to work on this song, and he asked what key the song was in, and Trent didn't really know. (laughs) Just like, uh, I don't know, I think it's E. And funnily enough, I do see that conversation referenced on this song's Wikipedia page. So there you go. Some songs really can last 30 years. To me, this song transitioned seamlessly from Gave Up, Unbroken. In fact, Mr. Self-Destruct could have been Unbroken. It would have fit right in there, to paraphrase the Big Lebowski. It has big, chunky guitar riffing, screamed vocals... A real aggressive vibe, and that's all broken. So fine, I'm thinking at this point. This is where this new album is headed. So he's still going in the same direction. Well, not so, because track two is Piggy, which is slow, swingy. It's dominated by bass and drums. It's just all groove. Now, I'm into bass and drums and, you know, bring in the funk, as you know. So I immediately like this song. We hadn't really heard down-tempo Nine Inch Nails since what, like something I can never have as an actual song with lyrics. So it was a welcome new vibe. And again, we talked about this in the pig face episode, the number of pig references that cropped up in industrial music in the nineties. And this song is one more of those, but some of these are related because this song title and the name of Reznor's home studio at the time, La Pig, were references to the Tate murders that occurred in that very same house where he recorded this stuff on Cielo Drive, where the Manson family wrote Pig in Blood on the wall. And that was a reference, I suppose, to the Beatles song Piggies from the White Album, another album I'd love to talk about someday. So there is a through line in some of this naming, at least for Nine Inch Nails. And by the way, Trent says he didn't realize he had bought the Tate house. He had only learned it after the fact and never really meant to capitalize on its infamy. In fact, he said he later had a run-in with Sharon Tate's sister and sort of rethought the wisdom of playing up that aspect of the house in his musical projects. He had already moved out by the time the Downward Spiral was released and he would be the house's last owner and it was demolished shortly after and good riddance. 
Anyway, Piggy is a cool song, and it was very awesome seeing it performed in 2013 with the great Pino Palladino playing bass. Just awesome. Track three is Heresy, which maybe comes closest to what I was expecting this album to sound like. It's a heavy industrial kind of tune with prominent beats and synths. Anyone looking for that hammer blow to the back of the cranium, that's your song. Uh, The chorus is about as blunt as can possibly be, and I quote, God is dead and no one cares. If there is a hell, I'll see you there. (laughs) So there you have it, folks. Not a lot of reading between the lines there. Anyway, 20-something me was thinking, all right, this is a cool-sounding, tough song. I dig it. So we're two for three at this point. And track four was March of the Pigs, which I was already familiar with from the single, so that was a win, naturally. And now, let's get to the meat of it. Track five, Closer. All right. Where to begin? I have to really try to get myself back in a 1994 headspace to recapture my first reaction to this song, because obviously, this song became tremendously popular Uh, and we've heard it all a billion times by now. It was the second single. It had a brilliant video. It pushed Nine Inch Nails into the mainstream consciousness. To me, though, I loved this song as soon as I heard the opening beats. I mean, that's what I was looking for on this album, some killer beats, and this is maybe the first song that really delivered that in a big way. Just that big fat kick drum sample delivering the four on the floor. As it turns out, it was a sample from Iggy Pop's classic track, Night Clubbing, which is a pretty amazing song in itself, but I didn't know that then. Uh, But that's what I was looking for, a heavy dance number, and Closer was it. It just happened to have ridiculously over-the-top lyrics that triggered every politician and further convinced them that rock music was evil, and Trent in particular was Beelzebub. Remember, This was only a couple of years after Tipper Gore's antics and setting up the PMRC. You know, that cadre of senators' wives who were interested in putting ratings on record albums. And thankfully, we had Frank Zappa, Dee Snyder, and others to stand up to that nonsense. Although we did wind up with this stupid parental advisory warning sticker that you see here. Um, They were all over the place. They were even on t-shirts for crying out loud. Um... Frankly, those just told me what CDs to buy. I mean, just like these stupid book bands that we're dealing with today. Honestly, folks, the list of banned books become my reading list. I buy these books right up for me and my kids. I'm like, hey, thanks for pointing out all the good books. You know, freaking book bands. You know, it's unfortunate that 25 to 30 percent of Americans suddenly think fascism is all right. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the Nazi book burners were the bad guys. And if I'm not mistaken, millions of Americans gave their lives to fight fascism. And now they think it's American. You know, they want to take away democracy and freedom and ban books and embrace totalitarianism. I really don't think that St. Regan would like that you're cozying up to the Russians. You know, give me a freaking break. Folks, these people, these book banners, they're all living in a fantasy world, but they are pointing out the good books for the rest of us. So we got that going for us. So take advantage, you know, support your local booksellers, support your transgressive authors and buy some banned books today. Support media that gives marginalized people a voice and fight the man, you know. Just like this music, you know, do you think the fascists, the religious or otherwise would approve of the downward spiral? Would they approve of a song like Closer? Of course not. It's not even a question. So if you're listening to me now, presumably it's because you love Nine Inch Nails and this album in particular, not because you like me or what I have to say. But if you like this sort of music, please be sure to get out and vote this November because you'd better believe there are people out there who are trying to silence artists, who are trying to silence anyone that doesn't conform to their narrow interpretation of religious morality. I mean, this is exactly what Trent himself preached against in the album Year Zero. This was the alternative reality he painted. And, you know, we joked about it back then, but it's starting to become reality. So it's not just me being paranoid. 
you know, I for one don't want to live in a theocracy. I don't want the morality police decreeing what sanitized music I'm allowed to listen to. And that's exactly what these bonehead school boards are doing with the book bans. And I'm sure that it won't stop there if they get their way. It'll continue with music, movies, and everything else. And if you're thinking now, well, hold on a minute. It's those woke libs who are trying to silence everyone. Why aren't you calling them out? Well, the answer is simple. You can always recognize the fascists because they're the ones punching down. And I will always side with the people who are punching up, punching those who traditionally have held and hoarded the power. Because folks, any asshole can punch down against the less fortunate, the marginalized, the vulnerable. It takes a real hero to punch up and fight for equity and justice. And punching up is what punk rock is all about. That's the whole point. It's art that feeds a lifestyle of true democracy with everyone being free to express themselves. There's no stifling of thought. There's diversity of viewpoints. There's decentralized control. There's cooperation across boundaries and industrial music flows from punk. The same standards apply. It's what KMFDM's motto is all about. Rip the system. What system do you think he's talking about? It's the establishment power structure. Of course, it's that 1% that's feeding off the rest of us and pitting ourselves against each other. So yeah, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. I'm going to reel it in before someone comes in here and gives me a doctorate in poli sci. We were talking about the song Closer. Of course, it would become one of their signature songs. Uh, they did release it as the second single, as you see here, since I don't have a physical copy. This was one of those album length singles with a million quote, reinterpretations and a couple B-sides. So there was a cool cover of Memorabilia by Soft Cell and a little thing called March of the F Heads, which is kind of like a violet fluid, just a bunch of beats. And of course, there was a video for Closer directed by Mark Romanek that really cemented this song in people's minds and brought it to a whole other level of visibility. In fact, it's maybe the first time that Trent said a video actually enhanced a song in his mind. I guess in 2006, it was voted the greatest music video of all time by VH1, which is maybe a dubious honor. Because back in my day, VH1 was MTV for adults. It wasn't nearly as cool. Maybe it's as cool as kids think of MTV being today. If they think of MTV at all, that is. I don't know. Do kids today even know what MTV was uh, or is? Anyway, Closer is a great jam. My favorite bit is the piano riff at the end. Uh, but the overall groove is awesome. I just like that song. I think everybody loves that song. So let's move on to track six, Ruiner. Uh, this is another cool industrial rock track. Big beat, check. Arpeggios, check. But there are some twists. I think the title here maybe refers to my reaction, hearing all the dumb wiener references in the chorus. I mean, <laughs> what is this, Beavis and Butthead? I don't know. It kind of ruins the song for me. It just makes it all feel a bit juvenile, to be honest. And, you know, Pretty Hate Machine was so heavily criticized for being juvenile, especially on RMI. Just a lot of teenage romance angst. And maybe it was, because, you know, Trent was just in his early 20s when he wrote all that stuff. And Broken managed to get past that, getting past that puppy love phase and into some real sheer hatred. And most of the downward spiral focuses on other things like addiction and depression. But then he throws in some lyrics to remind you that he's still thinking with his wang. I don't know, musically... I like this song, Ruiner. Lyrically, not so much. But it does take kind of a hard left turn in the middle into some drunken guitar breakdown, which is pretty rad, only to come roaring back into a beefy ending. So, okay, fine. And we go into track seven, which is The Becoming. I really like this track. I like the samples, the sound design. I think it's a great example of not doing industrial by the numbers, being really original with it. But it still rocks in an unpredictable kind of way. And just when you think you know where it's all going, there's an acoustic guitar interlude. But, you know, somehow it all works. Adrian Ballou is on this too, but he's credited with the ring mod guitar. So I guess that's him playing the really squealy leads in the second half, which is, you know, pretty rad. 
All right, so we're halfway through this. Let's see if I can keep my voice. Track eight, I do not want this. Now, I do think about this song pretty regularly, believe it or not, because I'm a drummer and I think the drum pattern is just so cool. I'm really surprised more songs don't steal it. Uh, and this is Stephen Perkins of Jane's Addiction on drums, by the way, which is really cool. Stephen's a great player. Uh, I was only tangentially into Jane's as a kid. I had one of my friends who was super into them, and I guess they kind of rubbed off on me from him. But yeah, this is another forward-thinking track, not unlike the Becoming in that way. The chorus is just about as hard as anything this band has ever done, and it hits all sorts of vibes in the verses. Um, you know, what can I say? I never skip that song when it comes on. Next up, Big Man with a Gun. A mercifully short blast of noise and more Wang references than you could shake a... I don't know, a Wang at, I guess. I don't know. Jeez. God, it's so depressing. Does anyone believe this song is about a literal gun? Uh, maybe I'm missing it. I think it's a big metaphor, you know, that's pretty easy to read. I don't know. Whatever. I'm just not into this song so much, so yeah, I do skip it. Then we go to track 10, A Warm Place, which is aptly named. Uh, some beautiful soft synth pads and actual pretty chord progression. Um, just great stuff. Uh, this is like a nice little oasis in the blasted wastelands of Trent's psyche, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. At least that's how it feels after going through the previous nine songs. It's kind of a breather. And honestly, it's just on its own, just a really cool listen. I'm sure, I'm sure that this was on a million chill out mix CDs in the nineties. It's just a pretty beautiful little song for anyone who thought this band was incapable of it. And maybe, maybe just a hint of Trent's future as someone who would score films. This was around the time after all that he was scoring natural born killers. So maybe this song nudged him in that direction? I don't know. Who knows? So next up, track 11, Eraser. I gotta say, at this point, all these industrial rock tunes get a little mixed up in my mind. And that's why I say this album seems a little long, a little redundant. There's just so many of these on here. And they're, they're all cool. They're just... I can't tell one apart from the other and they get mixed up in my head. Um, this is the one, I guess, that starts with him blowing the rhythm it sounds like he's blowing it against a piece of paper, which is okay. Like, that's clever, I guess. And it is an instrumental, except for like the last minute or so. Yeah, so it's not like I don't like this song, but it's just not that distinguished in my mind. And I could hear you saying, wait, but this is the emotional climax of the album, bro. He's literally chanting, kill me over and over at the end. To which I say, okay, fine, fair enough. But that kind of does beg the question as to why the next song is called Reptile, which is maybe the most industrial rock of all of the industrial rock tunes here, and also maybe the most misogynistic. I mean, is he blaming women for all his problems here? What is this stuff with, oh, my beautiful liar, oh, my precious whore? Or is this another clever metaphor? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But... Musically, this song kind of does kick ass, and I like the guitar solo after the first chorus. If it even is a guitar solo, I'm not sure what it is, actually. I mean, who can tell? Whatever it is, I like it. Uh, there are tons of cool samples in this song. Just really astounding production. But for my money, folks, and this is a, a good tip, the best performance of this tune was the one Trent did at a Boston radio station in 2006, with Atticus Ross, Jordy White, and with Peter Murphy on vocals. Definitely check that out if you haven't seen it yet. It's magic, and it made me appreciate this song all over again. So then we go on to the penultimate song, The Downward Spiral, which is arguably the dramatic peak here, not Eraser, because I guess you can't have a downward spiral without a bottom, and this song is it. So according to legend, there was supposed to be one more song here called Just Do It. And let me tell you, it wasn't a Nike ad, kids. So according to Wikipedia, which as we know is the next best thing to learning something, Flood refused to go along with it, saying Trent finally went too far. You know, oddly enough, the guy wasn't comfortable producing a song that encouraged self-harm. 
go figure. So yeah, we got this song instead, which is fine by me. And again, in my mind, this is one of those concepty Roger waters E songs that don't have much going on musically. So yeah, I tend to skip it. Your mileage may vary. And then we come to the piece de la resistance, Hurt, a song that many people still think was written and performed by Johnny Cash due to his very successful cover that came out in 2002, just a handful of months before he would pass away. But no, it was a Nine Inch Nails fan favorite for eight years by that time. And it's a dark song, but maybe one with the only bit of light on the entire album. When you listen to it, it's mostly Trent's voice with a guitar playing some dissonant arpeggios. And this song has had such a storied 30-year history, it's hard for me to think about the first time I heard it. But it struck me then as, it's just a great song. It's just great songwriting. I mean, I often talk about the bones of a song separate from the instrumentation, the production, the delivery, and all that stuff. I'm referring to... The platonic idea of the song, not any given instance of it. And Hurt is just a great song. Lyrically, you know, it might be about a specific thing, but it's still vague enough that I think just about anyone can find something in it to relate to. I mean, we've all been hurt. We've all been in that position. And that's what makes this song so powerful, the fact that it's so relatable. In a way, maybe, that I can't relate to a song like, I don't know, Ruiner or heresy say i don't know hurt just stands out and i gotta say that someday two three hundred years from now when no one remembers nine inch nails i'm pretty sure that this song will still be kicking around in fact i don't know that the band has ever released another song that's resonated with society the way this song has honestly most bands never even get a song like that so it's a real testament to trent's skill as a songwriter And, you know, I think it encouraged his critics to take another look at his work and consider it in a new light. And that's it. 14 songs in, uh, you know, an hour and change. A pretty long album that covers a very wide emotional and sonic territory. And two singles with, you know, another album's worth of material overall. So you might think that that would be enough from this era of the band. But think again, because Trent released a remix album further down the spiral in June of 95. And, uh, I mean, Broken had fixed, so in retrospect, it kind of made sense to have a remix album for the downward spiral. You know, it followed the same pattern. And who can blame him, really, because it kept the ball rolling with minimum effort on his part. After all, he could farm out mixes to other artists, uh, do some remixes on his own, you know, put together the ones they liked the most and repackage it to fit the theme. And, you know, it's one more thing to sell, to pump up the brand. Uh, Much like Fixed, there were remixes here from Coyle and J.G. Thorwell and a.k.a. Jim Fetus, and remixes by the band themselves, as well as one mix by Rick Rubin with help from Dave Navarro. And oddly, one and a half tracks that weren't remixes at all, but entirely new compositions by none other than Richard D. James, a.k.a. Aphex Twin, I guess you could say that he took his remixing job to the ridiculous extreme, not unlike the Orb, who would sometimes not include any of the original material. And what did I think of this remix album? I think I admired the idea of it more than I did the actual thing, because in fact, I never bought it and still haven't listened to it. I think I mentioned when I talked about Broken in episode 31 that This era of the band kind of rubbed me the wrong way with the endless remixing and repackaging with the clever mix names and all that. If you recall, this was during the endless remix singles era of the 90s and it was really excessive and I just lost patience with the whole thing, not to mention a lot of money out of my wallet. I just got fed up with it. Every album was just milked dry with singles and every single was issued in multiple parts and multiple formats with exclusive stuff and just dozens and dozens of crap remixes by all these no-hoper DJs. Now, granted, the Nine Inch Nails remixes were a lot more curated with a lot more talent going on. You know, not every band was looking for someone with the artistic heft of Coil 
and Aphex Twin to reinterpret their songs. So, you know, maybe now that I'm older, if not wiser, I should pick up a copy. Seems like something I should have in the old collection. Now, in the midst of all this nonsense, life kept happening. And that summer, you know, I hung out with friends. I got an internship at the place that would eventually launch my career. I lost someone who was close to me. I also played a lot of Doom and was in a breakup. I played a ton of guitar. Another strong memory of that summer was watching Woodstock 94. Now, some of you may be aware that the original Woodstock was a music festival that happened in upstate New York in 1969 during the so-called Summer of Love. Of course, it was a huge countercultural milestone One that I don't really identify with, not being into the whole hippie scene and, you know, not really being down with the hippies turning into the coke fiends of the 70s, the greedy Wall Street types of the 80s, and the moral majority of the 90s. But Woodstock did have Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner and, you know, I don't know, sha-na-na, I guess. So 25 years later, someone thought it would be a good idea to commemorate the original with another music festival, thus... Woodstock 94 was born, and the lineup was a mishmash of popular acts of the day, one of which was Nine Inch Nails. So, back home, Salty and I were pretty stoked, and needless to say, he ordered it on pay-per-view. And I remember sitting in his kitchen that night watching them play, and I don't remember if they broadcast the entire set. YouTube says that the band played for something like 80 minutes, but in my mind, I can really only remember them playing closer. I guess the rest has just been pushed completely out of my brain by creeping middle age, but I remember there was a general consensus in the music press after the fact that Nine Inch Nails stole the show. They objectively had the biggest crowd and just blew everyone away with their unusual performance, which involved being covered head to toe in mud and having so much energy that they were just attacking each other on stage, breaking their instruments and so on. And, you know, they generally acted in a way that made Metallica look like lightweights in comparison. So, guys, mission accomplished. And Salty and I were very enthusiastic, needless to say. So, that summer wound down. I went back to school as an upperclassman. I had uh, my pick of housing. So, a good buddy and I got a room with a private bathroom, which was rad. Also, we had the local pizza place and our meal plan for some reason. And then I had to explain to my mom why I used up all my food money after just six weeks. But somewhere in the midst of all that, Nine Inch Nails embarked on the self-destruct tour. And lo, they were coming to our city. Now, like I said, I was at school in the city, but Salty was living back home. So he offered to pick up some tickets for us and would drive out to pick me up and go to the show. Great. So we wind up going, I think it was in November, if I recall, and I can still picture it. We were sitting near the back, stage left, about halfway up. What do I remember? Um, Just a few images in my mind, really. One was of Marilyn Manson opening, and I wasn't into them. I didn't know their stuff, but I do remember they did a cover of Sweet Dreams by the Eurythmics. So, you know, they had that going for them. I also remember Manson stripping Bear at the end of his last song and getting carted off by the cops, which I figured was all pretty good shtick. I suppose. And then Nine Inch Nails came out. And I remember um, that they were just so great to watch. And this was my second show because back in episode eight, I talked about having seen them in 1990 on the Pretty Hate Machine tour in a tiny club. Um, But now they were filling a damn arena and I practically needed a telescope to see them from where I was sitting. I do remember the red lighting effects when they played the song, The Downward Spiral. I remember that they closed the set with Head Like a Hole before the encore and just how great it sounded in that space. It was way rockier than the album. Um, Closer started the encore and of course everyone went completely apeshit. And good old Setlist FM tells me that they did a cover of Dead Souls by Joy Division, uh, which they recorded for the soundtrack to the film The Crow. And I have no memory of them playing it, but I guess they did. And I'm positive that I was happy about it because I was and am a huge Joy Division fan. And that's it, really. I have far better recall of their show in 2013 
on the tour for hesitation marks. I can even recall some of Trent's onstage banter that night. So I know I'm not completely losing it. I guess it's just that my event horizon for recall is somewhere between 15 and 25 years. It's just harder to remember details before that. But needless to say, we were very happy with the show, and I was really impressed with the band's meteoric rise. So what happened next? Well, they toured a lot more, and of course Trent started doing soundtracks, first with Natural Born Killers, and then the video game Quake in 96, which I talked about in detail in episode 42. This era of the band continued, though, through 97, by which time I had graduated, started my career, and found the love of my life. And then they came out with a video called Closure that year, which maybe was aptly named since it ended the Downward Spiral era. It was a mix of live performances, music videos, arty clips by Peter Christofferson, and backstage antics. This release would then usher in the Fragile era which I wouldn't be on board for. I think I've listened to The Fragile exactly once in my life, uh, maybe about seven, eight years ago, when a newer friend of mine who's a fan of the band was just aghast. I hadn't heard it. He gave me a copy and urged me to just run home and listen. But, you know, for me, I have to listen to something, I don't know, five or six times to really absorb it. And it's a lot of work to listen to a two-hour album five or six times. It's just... I never did it. Uh, so who knows? Maybe I'll give it some deep listens in the, in the future and do an episode on it. But to be honest, I have no real memories of that album or With Teeth or Year Zero from back in the day. Um, the fact of the matter was I had just jumped off the Nine Inch Nails train for whatever reason. I just can't explain it. Uh, but I wouldn't jump back on again until Ghosts in the Slip in 2008 and of course would see them again live for hesitation marks which is maybe one of the top three shows i've ever seen in my life it was really mind-blowing and you know i'd pick up all their subsequent releases um i don't think that's a bad thing necessarily that i skipped a few albums because you know when the band inevitably goes inactive i'll still have some music to discover uh and so i'm sure i'll get around to them eventually So where are they now? Uh, Nine Inch Nails at the moment, I think, is officially on hold. Uh, Their last live activity was the big alumni reunion in Cleveland in 2022, where Trent brought back many of the former live members. Uh, Robin Fink, of course, is still in the band, but he invited Rich Patrick, Chris Vrenna, Danny Lohner, and Charlie Klauser to perform with the current live band, which also included Alessandro Cortini, Elon Rubin, and, of course, Atticus Ross. And honestly, if you watch those performances from Cleveland, they're just amazing because it's been 30 years, but this band has lost none of its energy. Uh, Check out their performance for Wish, for instance, and their cover of Filter's Hey Man, Nice Shot with Rich Patrick on vocals, of course, because that stuff is as hard hitting as anything they've ever done. I really believe that. And I think that's really saying something. Um... I'm sure these guys will eventually hit an age where they just can't do it anymore. They just can't do it like that anymore. But you know what? They haven't hit it yet. I, for one, thought it was also really cool to see Nine Inch Nails with nine members on the stage. (laughs) I just think there's something satisfying about that. But, you know, Trent posted afterward that he was putting that era of the band to rest. And that Nine Inch Nails, if it moved forward we'd become something different entirely. And that's cool too, you know, keeping it fresh. But until that happens, I guess we're left in suspense. Ah, delicious suspense. Maybe 2024 will involve some kind of 30th anniversary commemoration of the Downward Spiral. I guess time will tell. And there you have it, folks. The Downward Spiral by Nine Inch Nails. Uh, The landmark album from a landmark band. One that's irrevocably tied to my memories of 1994 and beyond, as I'm sure it is for many of you. You knew I'd get to it sooner or later. Its legacy was to reaffirm the importance of texture and sound design in modern music, and to stretch the audio palette into exciting new places, and also, also, to reaffirm the importance of the full album format for creating an end-to-end listening experience for delivering a unified theme, not just a collection of songs, 
And that would really buck against the trend in coming decades with the advent of the iPod and iTunes and streaming services. But I'd argue that Trent has always stuck up for that full album experience, even on his most recent albums. They're all designed to be listened to from end to end, not in some kind of shuffle mode. And that's the mark of a true artist. You're listening to Stronger Than Reason either on YouTube or as an Apple or Spotify podcast. The show that forgot to pay the springtime bill. That's why it's still ass cold outside, folks. It's my fault, my bad, but I did pay up this morning and have been assured it will warm up again next week for reals. So you're welcome. As always, thanks for listening. And until next time, stay strong.